Thank you very much to organizers for including my paper in the program. I'm uh, very happy to present my paper titled Corollary Dimensions and Asset Pricing. So my paper starts from uh, two silos back documented uh, by recent research. First, uh, financial markets appear to be surprisingly priced in elastic. When, and when asset demand is not that much sensitive to uh, prices, then demand shocks can have very large effects on asset prices. Um, and according to Crimson Yogo, uh, demand shocks uh, seem very important in explaining asset prices. Uh, they show that uh, latent demand shocks uh, explain up to 81% of the total uh, stock return volatility in the cross section. However, they call this the, uh, they call these demand shocks latent demand shocks because we do not observe why these demand shocks arise in the first place. So here comes my paper. So my paper has two contributions. The first contribution is to identify a strong driver of correlated demand shocks arising from benchmarking. So by benchmarking, I mean active equity institution investors, common incentive to outperform the stock market index, such as the S&P 500. And I show that the resulting correlated demand shocks uh, increase stocks market risk, and surprisingly, the implication of market risk is strongly priced. So what do, I mean, what do I mean by benchmarking? My paper starts from a simple observation that many active institutional investors have a similar market index to bid, such as the S&P 500. Just to give you a concrete number, in the active mutual fund space, more than 60% of the fund managers have the S&P 500 index as their benchmark. And if you think about Russell Indices, Russell Indices, the number gets even bigger. It's a very common incentive for active fund managers to outperform the stock market. And the key inside of my paper is about like asking these questions. So I asked those benchmarking uh, induces active institutional investors to trade assets in, in a similar manner. And I find the answer is yes. And I find that this incentive generates procyclical risk-taking behavior among active fund managers. By procyclical, I mean, they tend to exert buying pressure for stocks when the stock market is rising and they do the opposite when the stock market is falling. And notice that because the direction of the stock trading coincides with the direction of the stock market movements, I find that the resulting correlated trades from these investors amplify stocks market exposures. And here, the, here are my main findings of my paper. So I find that in a cross section, stocks with high exposure to correlated demand from benchmarking uh, have higher market betas and risk premium than those stocks with low exposure to demand shocks because of the implication of market risk. And the economic magnitude is quite sizable because in desktop portfolios formed by uh, for, uh, sorting stocks based on their differential exposure to demand shocks, I find the annual return premium about 8.5%. Okay. And this risk materializes during bad times such as in the global financial crisis of 2008 because those stocks with very high exposure to correlated demand from benchmarking experience sharp price crashes that are associated with massive selling pressures from their institutional stockholders. Uh, to start, I'll uh, talk about the mechanism because it's not entirely clear why benchmarking generates procyclical risk-taking behavior. To explain the mechanism, I start from this fact. We all know that active fund managers struggle to beat the stock market, but what is really interesting is about the time series. They actually struggle more when the stock market is performing better, meaning that when their benchmark is performing better, so here, the y-axis is a fraction of underperforming funds, and the x-axis is uh, contemporaneous stock market returns. And you can see there's a strong positive relationship between the two. And when the stock market is doing well, typically more than 60% of the fund managers struggle to beat their benchmark. And here's an anecdotal evidence. You know that in the year of 2021, the stock market performed spectacularly. However, according to this news article, about 85% of active fund managers couldn't beat the S&P 500. So they're under pressure to improve their fund performance because otherwise investors will be disappointed. So I will just do a simple thought experiment. So suppose I'm a fund manager who is in the same situation, basically stock market is going up, but my fund performance is lagging. Then I gotta find a way to improve my fund performance because otherwise investors will be disappointed. And this situation creates a strategic incentive for me as a fund manager to increase the riskiness of my fund. Because by increasing the riskiness, I might have a chance for risk direction. And here are the things I would do as a fund manager. So I typically hold some cash just to be ready for 
unexpected outflows, but now I want to give up on this liquidity management because I'm under pressure to improve my fund performance. So I'll rather decrease my cash holdings to buy more stocks so that my portfolio has a higher market exposure. If I'm out of cash, if I don't have a leverage constraint, I may even lever up my portfolio. But if I have a leverage constraint, I'll probably tilt toward riskier stocks such as high beta stock. The bottom line is that when the stock market is doing well, because a lot of active fund managers underperform as a group, they systematically increase the risk in their funds at the same time by buying more stocks to have a higher market exposure at the same time. And this risk-taking strategy will just work fine on average because having a higher market exposure means a higher risk premium on average. However, if I'm an unlucky fund manager in the sense that after increasing the market exposure on my portfolio, the stock market subsequently crashes unexpectedly. Then I'm into, I'm into a real problem because investors will be immediately disappointed and they'll withdraw their investment. But remember, I increase the equity exposure on my portfolio by decreasing my, decreasing my cash holdings, which means that I, have, I don't have enough cash buffer to deal with this large outflow. So I, as a fund manager, I'm likely to become a net stock seller because I have to deal with this large redemption. And the bottom line of this thought experiment is that active institutional investors' demand for stocks is likely to positively co-vary with the direction of the stock market movements potentially amplifying stocks market exposures. And the empirical evidence is consistent with the notion of prospective risk-taking risk -taking behavior. These are active mutual funds. And you can see that when the stock market is performing well, as they underperform, they tend to decrease their cash holdings if they tend to be a net stock buyer during the good stock market performance. And this is consistent with the notion of uh, procyclical risk-taking behavior to catch up with the market performance. So given this risk-taking behavior that varies across time, now I, I'll think about the cross-section. So, so now I'll think about which stocks are highly exposed to these forces given this behavior of risk-taking uh, that varies over time. To answer this question, I will develop a simple model. And the goal is to understand the cross-sectional variation exposure to correlated dimension shocks. And I, will do, I want to do it in a very simple manner. So I'll develop a very stylized model but it will be very useful because it will guide my empirical work in a simple manner. Specifically in the model, funds will buy when the stock market is rising, and they will do the, do the opposite when the stock market is falling for some unknown exogenous reason. I will also show in the paper uh, uh, that the same economic forces can arise endogenously due to benchmarking, building on a more realistic model uh, based on uh, Basak and Pavlov's 2013 AR. But this model is uh, empirically less tractable, I'll, so I'll work at the simple model instead. So in this world, there are multiple stocks indexed by K, and there are active, multiple active fund managers indexed by I. And each fund will adjust it, it, its equity exposure over time. Here, delta A is net dollar purchases or sales of stocks at the fund level, and the denominator is the lag fund AUM. So again, for example, if I'm a fund manager and if I underperform, I will increase the riskiness of my portfolio by buying more stocks to catch up with the market performance. And in that case, delta A will be positive at the fund level. And the, given the evidence, early evidence I showed you, um, I will potentially model the direction of the stock trading as a function of contemporaneous stock market returns as in equation number one. So here, theta is a parameter to be estimated, which turns out to be positive, and this is consistent with the notion of procyclical risk-taking behavior. And again, delta A here is net dollar purchases of sales of stocks at the fund level. And given this quantity, the, what one will do is it will distribute this amount uh, according to across stocks according to a predetermined wave function called pi. So let's say, for example, delta A is hundred dollars. With this money, let's say I buy $40 amount of stock A and $60 amount of stock B, the sum is the $100, then the weight will be 40% for stock A and 60% for stock B. Okay. So the sum of the weight should be equal to one. And in this case, the dollar flow to asset K due to fund I's trade will be delta A times pi. And I model 
pi as follows. It will be a function of a portfolio weight and lambda is another parameter to be estimated and S is the ownership ratio of a fund. So basically how many, how many shares the fund hold divided by the total number of shares outstanding. To understand equation number two, it's uh, useful to think about a special case where lambda is equal to zero. In that case, the weight function is simply equal to portfolio weight, meaning that whenever funds adjust their equity exposures over time, they'll either scale up or scale down their investment in proportion to their current portfolio weights. However, with positive lambda, what I have in mind is the possibility that large funds internalize the price impact of their own trades. Okay, so to give you an intuition, I find it useful to think about a rather extreme real world example. So early 2021, uh, ARC fund was in trouble because of the poor, poor uh, performance. It experienced an outflow of about 2.7% in a single week. So Kathy Ewood had to find a way to deal with this large uh, disappointment. So she had to sell some of her stock holdings and look at this stock called CGEN. Its portfolio weight, the ARC fund's portfolio weight is not that big, it's about 0.5%, but the fund's ownership ratio is nearly 30%. So this news article tells us that if Kathy Wood had distributed this outflow simply according to the portfolio weight, then the fund would have generated large selling pressure for this stock. So going back to this equation number two, Kathy Wood then will be cautious in trading stocks that she heavily owns, meaning she will have this positive lambda. She will tend to decrease the size of the trades, trying to minimize the price impact her own fund creates. And this lambda will turn out to be strongly positive in estimation. With the structures, I end up with a nice model implied in Dazen's market exposure. The model tells me that market exposures are positive function in what is on the right-hand side. Here, it'll be a, fun, a sum of all the funds trades. So again, each term is as follows. The first component is expected amount of equity adjustments over time. And the fund will distribute this amount according to the predetermined wave function. So if you multiply these two, it'll be a net, it, it'll be a dollar flow into asset K due to funds I, I's trade. And if you sum this quantity over all the funds, it'll be a net dollar flow into SAK due to all the funds trades. And the resulting amount is large relative to the stock market value. It'll move prices, so there will be a price impact, which will affect market betas, again, because the direction of active fund stock trading will coincide with the direction of the market movements. I work at this modern product exposure, as well as an empirical proxy, which is the number of institution owners. So basically how many funds are holding a stock? This is a very nice, nice proxy for the model implied exposure because having a higher institution owners means that the stock is exposed to correlated demand shocks from even more funds. More importantly, at the same time, having a higher institutional owners means that the uh, ownership structure is highly dispersed, meaning that each owner is small so they're not particularly concerned about the price and pick of their own trades. However, when they, whenever they adjust their equity exposure over time, they'll be relatively more aggressive in trading these stocks. So the wave function will be relatively higher across all the funds. So it will generate a larger price and pick as a result. So the model tells me that betas are a positive function in what is on the right hand side model implied exposure and it's empirical proxy. So I'll run a following regression as follows. So this stock quarter level, following effect regression, and Y variable is a stock's market exposure as uh, captured by market beta. And you can see that there's a positive relationship between market exposure and stock exposure to correlated demand from benchmarking. And the economic magnitude is sizable because if you look at the third column, an interquartile range increase in model implied exposure leads to a higher market beta of 0 0.35, which is very big. And given this evidence on market beta, the next question is about uh, whether this price is a price risk. To answer this question, I first run a file market regression with a different y variable, which is uh, future stock returns. 
And you can see that stock's exposure to correlated demand from benchmarking is a strong predictor of future stock returns. And this return predictability can be also found uh, in portfolio stores. On the top table, I store stocks based on the modern plot exposure. And you can see that uh, average monthly uh, portfolio returns increase from the bottom to the top of the portfolio. And the spread between the top and the bottom of the portfolio is about 57 basis point per month. And what is really nice about this table is that return spreads are explained by the differences in market exposures across the portfolio. So the spread in market beta between the top and the bottom of the portfolio is about 0 0.4. With the empirical proxy, I get even a larger spread as well as a larger spread in uh, market beta as well. You can see that from the bottom to the top of the portfolio, average portfolio returns increase and the spread is even larger, 71 basis point per month. And all the return spreads are fully explained by the differences in market betas across the portfolio. And you can see that the spread in beta is about 0 0.5. And this risk does materialize during bad times, such as in the global financial crisis of 2008, because those stocks with the high exposure to correlated demand from benchmarking experience sharp price crashes, which are associated with massive selling crashes among their institutional stockholders. You can see the ownership level for the stocks in the top of the portfolio was about 80% right before the global financial crisis, but the ownership level decreases toward below 60%, which is a massive correlated selling pressure among those uh, institutional investors. And I have uh, additional re results, uh, but, but for the sake of time, I'll uh, skip this part and I will uh, conclude. So, my paper starts from an observation, again, that many active institutional investors, many active fund managers have a similar market index to beat. And I show you that this common incentive generates procyclical risk-taking behavior among them. And this forces uh, amplify stocks market risk. And this amplification of market risk translates into stock price crashes during bad times, including global financial crisis and COVID-19 crisis. And this, this risk commands a risk premium about up to 8.5% per year. 